we have a lot of competing interests that need to be considered as we look into the future of 2030. And we can't stick our head in the sand with those things. We have a growing population. We have a housing crisis. We have this want to conserve our natural beauty. How do we bring all those together and actually forge a future that we design as a community with future thinking? In today's episode of the Second Renaissance, Jackie Scrooby visits the Think Studio. Jackie is a teal independent candidate for Pittwater, Sydney in the 2023 New South Wales elections and as a local resident in this magic peninsula that I like to call home, I've personally really been looking forward to this deep and meaningful with one of our resident polymaths, Jackie Scrooby. The topics we touch on are global in nature, but local in their implications. And whether you're an international or a national listener or viewer or a fellow Pitwater resident, I believe this conversation has so much global savoir faire on the state of the world and what we would like it to become. In this conversation, we decode how Jackie's professional background and childhood converge at this moment in time to set her up to run on a platform of climate, integrity and gender equality what she learned about disruptive innovation from working alongside Dr. Sophie Scomps and other independent female voices in national politics, her war on plastic waste, Jackie's views on the circular economy, how the green transition can be accelerated, the trust busting effects of greenwashing, the dichotomy of the world's largest coal export in port sitting just north of the Kurungai National Park, the importance of conservation and her futuristic vision for Sydney's northern beaches in 2030. Now a few words on pedigree. Jackie Scrooby is an environmental lawyer, management consultant, serial entrepreneur, medical science graduate, climate change warrior and mum. Most recently she was an advisor to the independent federal member of parliament, Dr Sophie Scomps. She's running for the seat of Pittwater and has already asserted real world influence with the incumbent government torpedoing gas exploration off the coast of Sydney because of the rise of environmental consciousness in the local community. She's looking forward to continuing to champion the issues of climate, integrity and gender equality and to ensuring that we do not see another lost decade on climate action. Welcome to the second renaissance, Jackie. Jackie Scrooby, welcome. Hi, Anders. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Nice to run into you at the studio, not uh, just at Bucacino. Yeah, and I have shoes on today. My children said when I arrived, why are you wearing high heels in Avalon? And I said, I've got an important podcast. To okay. Oh, I should have worn my high heels. I'm, uh, I'm wearing my uh, clogs uh, from, uh, from Germany at the moment. So welcome to the Second Renaissance. Thank you. To talk all things future and, of course, the teal movement. Um, I want to kick us off uh, quickly, Jackie, with um, the observation that you're a bit of a polymath, uh, if I was to describe you. You're an environmental lawyer, management consultant, serial entrepreneur, medical science graduate, climate change warrior, mum, campaign advisor, and now, of course, teal politician vying for the seat of Pittwater. Uh, in the New South Wales Parliament. How do these things all converge? Tell us a little bit about your experiences and how, how you landed in this moment in time. Yeah, great. Well, I think firstly, um, in terms of where I am now and running for politics for the New South Wales Parliament, I think a polymath or someone with lots of lived experience, life experience, different career experience is actually what more is required in New South Wales Parliament, um, particularly when you're running as an independent and you need to be across, you know, all portfolios and all issues. Um, in terms of my background, it has, I suppose, had two common themes. So the first theme is, make, I mean, making the world a better place, which is one of the key drivers for, you know, my career and the way I've made life choices. And that's been obviously environmental lawyer um, and then segued in that same, you know, that same category and area of interest, which is advising, you know, ASX 200 companies and governments on climate policy, environmental policy, and that seg segued into management consultancy very neatly um, and, you know, it was a very similar similar career area to be following. Uh, and I've been in that 
industry twice. So I had a break in between when I had children and that's when I decided to, you know, be an entrepreneur and start my own business in a completely different field, which was um, in homewares actually. So not su- not so sustainable. I went offline for a while in terms of my environmental career pursuits. Um, but that again was also where I was at in my life and I saw a business opportunity and I like being a doer. So, you know, I, I took the opportunity of maternity leave to follow a different passion. But also what strikes me when I've looked at the teal movement at a, at a federal level, where, of course, your teal colleagues, Dr. Sophie Scombs, for example, who you work closely with, Climate 200, the feeling I get as an entrepreneur uh, and as a local here in Avalon is that, you know, they are taking a very sort of localized, almost entrepreneurial approach. Apo- you know, approach to politics, this sort of, you know, disruptors approach that we hear about a lot in entrepreneurship, for example. Um, So I think that having that entrepreneurial background amongst all the other backgrounds as well, of course, I would strike me as a key when you're trying to disrupt the establishment in a sense. Exactly. And I think for me, I've always had this battle with, you know, as an entrepreneur thinks or as a strategist thinks, um, what is the best use of my time and my skills to get the maximum benefit um, and give the most. And I think for me, that's always been a struggle between is it individual activism, which has a definite role? Is it advising business and, you know, having an influence on business or is it advising, you know, government or now being in government? Mm -hmm. And I think um, one of the things that I've heard um, speak about, uh, that Climate 200 speaks about is, you know, action is either hacking at the branches or, you know, finding this model to be able to get representatives in that represent their community on the issues that matter to them. And for our community, one of those huge issues is climate change, another is integrity, that actually having representation in parliament is the most effective way to achieve that. And that resonates with me. And it sounds like you guys have just had a big win with PEP 11. Do you want to just talk us through that a little bit? Look, I think what's happened in the last couple of weeks is testament to the positive value that independents play in the political spectrum. So as you know, I'm not elected yet, but even just having um, an independent presence in this electorate has uh, had the New South Wales government react in a positive way. So offshore oil and gas drilling is something that no one in this community wants. Um, As we know, it's been uh, a bit of an election issue at the federal election when Scott Morrison came out and said something fantastic, which was Pep 11's dead in the water. That then turned out to be challenged in the federal court. And we've recently heard that um, both parties agreed to consent orders, so the matter never proceeded to court. That means it's back on the table with a joint authority. Um, The actual federal has veto over that authority, but we've been looking at different ways that as a New South Wales state, we can actually try and block or prevent that project. Um, I worked with existing members of the crossbench to come up with a bill to basically not approve any infrastructure to support the project, so put significant hurdles in the way. And then uh, the current New South Wales government responded saying that if they were elected, they'd put in similar legislation, which transpires is doesn't go as far as mine. And um, there's a been in the newspaper today about that as well. But mm. but yes, we, it shows within 12 days an issue that they haven't done anything on in many years um, was acted upon. So a win for independence. Yeah, fantastic. I was going to ask, so from a pit water perspective, um, I mean, our listenership here, while many are locals, many are Sydney siders living in, in Australia, etc. we also have an international audience as well. Uh, everyone wants to move to Australia, of course, being the, the future sustainable <laughs> superpower, as Dr. Ross Garno calls it. Um, Um, But I'm I'm curious to learn a little bit more about uh, climate integrity and gender equality, which are the sort of, you know, concepts or platforms, values on which you guys are running. I mean, what do these mean in in practical terms for you as an independent, but also why is it really imperative that Pitwater and, of course, other voters wholly embrace these concepts, particularly, I guess, in an era where there are, you know, inflationary and recessionary concerns and people are thinking about their hip pockets as well? Yeah, well, there's a few things in that question. So firstly, I think um, to start at the beginning and this, you know, so-called teal movement, which is actually community-backed independent movement, which started really with Cathy McGowan in Indi many years ago. And that is the process of listening to the community, distilling what they're saying, and then 
ultimately finding a person who will represent those values. And that's what the Pittwater community or McKellar, which is the federal seat, the process that they have gone through over many years, producing reports what the community wants and then finding a candidate that fits the bill. And I'm humbled enough to, you know, be that candidate. Um, so in terms of what Pittwater wants, it's, yes, integrity, um, climate action, equality, and how that transpires at a federal level is different to a state level. So in terms of Pittwater, um, it happens in our local area. So some examples would be better transparency and integrity around our hospital, which is a public-private partnership and has had some transparency issues, some infrastructure projects, which is, you know, we've got a huge infrastructure project on the horizon, the Beaches Link Tunnel, that hasn't had the business case released. Um, so they're small integrity issues, but then also the people of Pittwater want their government to be full of integrity. And we've seen recent, you know, John Barillaro, um, pork barrelling scandals and jobs for mate scandals, and they don't want that as well. So I think it translates at both... Uh, a local level and also a state level and federal level. Um, and then in terms of climate, of course, we want to keep pit water beautiful. We're vulnerable to a lot of climate risks, whether that be coastal erosion, um, flooding, we see that every day or, you know, at least every week um, with our infrastructure. And um, and also we want that on a state level, so no new coal and gas and also protection of our native forests. So I think when people are considering state elections and what that means for those issues, it's what how it impacts their particular electorate but also how it impacts the state and how they can have a voice at state level. Mm. We had um, Simon Holmes Accord, one of your colleagues and one of the founders of Climate 200 on, on the show just recently. Recently, and um, uh, we went to a fantastic launch event uh, at Moby Dick's up at Palm Beach or uh, Whale Beach uh, just last week, where I think you attended as well. And at that event, they mentioned something that was just phantasmagorical or uh, mind blowing, mind boggling to me that just north of Pittwater, on the other side of, of the Hawkesbury, essentially, we've got the largest. Uh, coal shipping port in the world in Newcastle. What do you think about that sort of you know juxtaposition of you know fossil fuels just you know slightly to the north of you know the Kurungai National Park and all this beautiful natural landscape that we have here, or even you know the Pep Eleven issues, for example. Yep. Um, I'll pull you up on one thing first, which is only because there's misinformation on it, but I'd say Simon is the founder of Climate 200, but I don't really have anything to do with Simon on a day-to-day -day level. So he's just the founder of this amazing grassroots community that is crowdfunding to support um, lots of campaigns, particularly at a federal level, but at a New South Wales level, there are severe restrictions on donations. So we haven't had as much support, only endorsement, which you know I'm really grateful for. Um, but in terms of that juxtaposition you were talking about, I think it highlights really why we need an independent voice on the issue of climate in particular and integrity. And it goes to, you know, this concept, this broader concept of sort of greenwashing and, and having truth in advertising and truth in what you tell your constituents. So I think that's one thing with the New South, the current New South Wales government. Um, they keep relying on their you know, green credentials and they have done fantastic work when it comes to, you know, energy infrastructure and, you know, you know, trying to make the state of New South Wales powered on renewable energy. Um, but there are these big gaping holes which, you know, from a visual level, the mm. juxtaposition between a huge coal port, the biggest in the world, just, you know, the next electorate up. Um, and as you say, this sustainable, you know, bubble that, you know, in a lot of ways we live in here up on the beautiful peninsula. Mm. Um, and I think that's why we need an independent voice in parliament to say, look, okay, it's great you've done these two policy measures, but there are these, you know, other group of policy measures which are huge gaping holes, which completely undermine the other work you've done unless we start to address those as well. So mm. I think that's the role as an independent to highlight those and then to work on policy to, you know, get us up to speed in those areas as well. Mm. well I mean, you were very much involved in the federal campaign with Dr. Sophie Scombs. And um, I'm curious, I mean, what, what, what lessons did you learn as a, as, a, as a human, as a campaigner, and now politician um, that you guys are applying now at a, at a state level? Um, I think the biggest lesson I've learned from Sophie is learning how to not be an empath and not to care too much what people say, which is, I think, critical because it's one of the reasons many people don't 
getting to Parliament and particularly, I mean, the New South Wales Parliament is called the Bear Pit. Um, we've had the Broderick Review, we've had the Jenkins Review at a federal level and I think that ability to not be scared to go into that environment and to advocate for your community is really important mm -hmm. and through the campaign process and also working with Dr Scomps in federal parliament it means that you know I've learnt to see her resilience and she was also a an emergency doctor. So she's, yeah. you know, learnt that resilience over time. Um, and that would be a great lesson that I've learned. And I think the other thing is that I really came to work with, um, I'll call her Sophie, it's a casual interview, but That's all right. I came to work with Sophie because of my experience in climate. But through that process, I was involved heavily in the concept of a community-backed independent and listening to the community and actually representing them on issues they care about. And I think that's the biggest transition for me is not just coming in with a couple of single issues that I personally care about, but learning the importance and strength of listening to the community and actually being an advocate for the community on a whole range of issues. And at state level, that even goes to, you know, schooling and infrastructure and um, and health as well. Mm. So that's been the journey. I came to it from a climate perspective, but actually, you know, I've fallen hook, line and sinker for this different way of doing politics, which is listening to the community and not being tied to a party. So if we go even sort of further back, I'm, I'm curious uh, on, on a personal level, tell us a little bit about the person, Jackie, the local, uh, <laughs> behind the politician. I mean, what, what, what inspires you? What concerns you? Who does the recycling at home? Anything uh, else? Okay. So, um, I, you know, I tend to do a million different things, which I love. And I think that's because, you know, I've got interest in a whole different, you know, group of areas. So, um, in terms of my background, I've always tried to, you know, seize opportunities and have a full wealth of life experience. So, I've lived in Melbourne, um, where I was a lawyer down in Melbourne. I've lived also in the UK and my kids actually came back to Australia with little English accents. Mm -hmm. um, and through that process a real love of travel and seeing different cultures and and seeing, you know, inspiring ways and, you know, best practice ways that other countries live and also areas where, you know, you think, goodness, I'm so grateful to have, you know, been brought up in Australia and have what we have here. Mm. And I think through that experience, that's actually spur continued to spur on my um, interest in, you know, climate change and environmental activism. It actually, an experience in, in Greece actually led me to living zero waste, um, which was an incredible challenge. But, you know, it, it was a lovely story. We were on an island and we realised that actually our waste was going to a tip that just led straight to the Mediterranean. So we quickly decided mm. we were pretty much eating vegetables and meat for the rest yeah. of the holiday. And then um, and then we just kept that going when we got back home and, and um, others asked me how we did it. So I sort of made a course because it is incredibly difficult to do. Um, so I think that sort of is testament to my love of travel you know, giving things a go and, um, and you know, stretching the boundaries mm -hmm. a little bit as well. And so, being in nature, which is why we live here and yeah. have a surf in the morning and a swim. Yeah, Why nice. my hair doesn't look perfect. <laughs> that's all right. The, 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 the salty hair here. You never here, regret here a one. swim. Yeah, that's it. That's always a good start to the day. So no uh, no recycling needed at home because there's no plastic that actually comes well, into we, home. Well, we recycle. And look, to be honest, my husband's doing a lot of the – the support at home at the moment. So we not, might not be as perfect as we once, and that's no slide on him. But, um, but yeah, usually just glass recycling yeah. and tin recycling yeah. would be in our bin. Perfect. And then a small amount of waste every week to, to landfill because, mm. you know, people send you things in the post and there's some things you just can't avoid. But, cool. but yeah. I, I know a really good six-week online no plastics course that we can take <laughs> if he needs a hand. Well, I did start that because other people were asking, how do you do it? And and it shouldn't be that hard mm. as well. So I think there is a role for government in terms of, you know, regulating both sides of a circular economy. So that's, um, you know, encouraging manufacturers and, and retailers to use less um, recyclable materials more recyclable materials and less materials that can't be recycled. Um, and then also at the other end, making sure, you know, as we've seen with the red cycle disaster, if you are recycling, that there's then a market for those um, for those end products to be reused into something else. So, you know, it shouldn't be as hard as it is and it is quite difficult to, you know, live zero waste in today's society. Mm. So definitely a lot of improvements that can be made from a government perspective. For those who of us who don't, know or for our listeners and viewers internationally or otherwise who are not tuned into the red cycle 
uh, slash sort of Woolworths saga. And um, can you just tell us a little bit more about what happened there? And uh, you don't need to mention names necessarily, yeah. although I've just disclosed you just them. Did it. <laughs> um, and and also, like, what's the state of? Secondly, what's the state of Australia's recycling system? And is that something that you guys are pushing towards improving? Yeah, so it's interesting because when I told you that story about being on an island and then we actually were living in London at that stage and we got back to London and I thought I'd been a diligent recycler like all Australians have grown up to be and I thought, oh, it's fine, now we're back and, you know, we got our, you know, won't mention the name. Well, I will actually, my avocado delivery over there and it was when I say full of plastic, you know, an avocado was wrapped in a plastic case which was then wrapped in a soft plastic container on top. And my kids said, well, why aren't we doing it here? And it was just sort of serendipitous that that week I said, oh, it's fine because recycling here is great. And then that week in the paper it came out that our, the borough next door to us, so the council next door to us, their recycling, in inverted commas, had been found um, illegally dumped in Malaysia by a riverbed. Mm -hmm. And suddenly it all made sense that, you know, the system was broken, that, yes, it was getting counted as recycling as it was shipped offshore and leaving the UK, but actually there was no accountability and it was being illegally dumped in Malaysia. And at that same time, that's what's sort of been highlighted here. So Australia was shipping offshore our recycling. Um, but actually since then, and to Australia's credit, we now have a national recycling strategy and also um, one at New South Wales level as well. And part of that strategy and the targets are actually a commitment to keep our waste onshore. Mm. There's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of building facilities and managing that, but that's the first step is saying that we'll take responsibility for our own waste. Now, the second step, which is making sure we've got the facilities and then the market to, to use the recycled product um, or the output, the example is the red cycle fiasco, which obviously is, you know, people diligently keeping their soft plastics, which aren't collected by council, taking them into their supermarket to be recycled and thinking that they're being recycled, but instead, they've been stored you know over many months and there are look I don't want to quote the number but thousands of football fields you know worth of soft plastics mm. being stored um, with no recycling or intent to recycle and um, and now just need to go to landfill or be discarded of which is what the Australian government's working with those companies at the moment mm. to to work out what to do but it just highlights the need for you know firstly transparency and that integrity um, in that service and so when that service isn't meeting the requirements being honest with the market way earlier and secondly government's intervening to to sort of tweak the market to make it sing along. Mm. And I guess that's the thing, though. Like, there's a lot. There's a lot of passionate recyclers there. Um, like your husband, I'm also an <laughs> avid recycler. But then to find out about the red cycle scandal, you know, you sort of lose a bit of faith. And, and like, actually, I found that on a personal level, I was starting to go towards spending more of my disposable dollars with Woolworths, partly because I was bringing them my soft plastics, and I'm going. I need some milk as well yes. rather than, you know, some of their competitors because I thought, hey, they're really, really doubling down on recycling and, and, and their footprint, et cetera. And so it's really, you know, disheartening when when something like that happens. And, you, and I guess that is the, the, the challenge with some of these, you know, recycling schemes or even, you know, the notion of environmental, social and governance, which has become, you know, a trending topic for organisations. Like, how, how do we know it's not just greenwashing? How do you know that whether it's politicians, you know, on the New South Wales, you know, liberal level or whether it's a company, how do you know that people are actually bona fide about these things? Yeah, it's really hard. And like, I felt what you felt as well when I f suddenly realised, oh, recycling doesn't work. And I kind of went to the extreme of, okay, well, I need to take personal responsibility and not use any of it, which mm. is just unrealistic for most people, which I completely accept. And I don't expect everyone to go down that path. Um, however, I also don't want to demonise the concept of striving for, you know, sustainability at a corporate level. And some of the programs like the Carbon Disclosure Project that have been around for many years encouraging companies to disclose their credentials. Now, where we get into that fine line between greenwashing and, um, and you know, actually making sustainable changes, I think that's one ultimately we've seen the market kind of decide when this gets revealed and, you know, share prices drop or investors aren't happy. But I think we're at a point now where actually um, – the regulators are starting to step in as well. So with in terms of carbon-related disclosure, um, we've got the Task Force for Climate-Related 
Oh, TCFD, Task Force for Climate. I'll, I'll remember the outcome oh, we'll in a, a fact, second. We'll do a little it's, fact yeah, check. Yeah, it will be in the online notes. Task Force for Climate-related risk disclosure. Um, Boom. But that's sort of a framework that's been set by the UN and that is compulsory in a lot of countries and is soon mm. to be compulsory in Australia. And I think that's because what we're coming to this point in history where sustainability isn't just a nice thing to do. It's not something that may, you know, get you more dollars and so a company is incentivised to do that to sort of capture a different market share. But actually it makes economic sense to do so, particularly when it comes to climate change. So um, we're at a point where shareholders need to know the impact of climate risk on a company's, um, you know, assets because that could actually be, you know, devastating to a company in the long term. So, for example, if you've got a rail company and we're facing in 30 years consistently hot days of over 40 degrees and that railway is going to bend and buckle and so it renders that asset mm. pretty much useless for certain days of the year, that's obviously going to impact the value of the company. So mm. that's why I think we're at a point now where it's going to become compulsory and it's actually going to become regulated by, you know, APRA, ASIC, and um, and it's those different levels that will come together in terms of free market and, and shareholders and customers keeping companies accountable, but also the regulators stepping in as well. Mm. Yeah, it's a fascinating idea, this idea of stranded assets and, and infrastructure that is actually not climate change ready. And we're already seeing it with insurers in Europe and in the United States refusing to insure coal-fired power plants in the future, which means that they can't even be operated, right? Because yeah. they're, they're uninsurable. So it is, I feel like we are living in this sort of zeitgeist shift moment or paradigm shift away from from the old and and, and towards, um, towards the new. Um, one of the things that people keep talking about, we, we refer to the, you know, idea of the hip pocket, you know, obviously energy bills are on the rise, you know, there, there's talks about, you know, um, various subsidies for that and, you know, caps on pricing for gas, etc. At the same time, Australia sits on this treasure trove of latent, renewable, cheap energy. Um, what can you as a, as a politician and other change makers do to facilitate the green transition faster? Great. So I think um, in terms of the federal level, the government has the rewiring the nation policy and, you know, targets to increase renewable energy you know, by 82%, I think it is, um, over the next few years. So I think at a federal level that's happening, the, that we are, we are still, you know, I suppose living the legacy of a government that did nothing in this area. So when we look at, you know, spiking um, prices at the moment, it's got a few reasons. One, we haven't done the rollout of renewables that you mentioned early enough. Um, as such, we're, you know, not, we're not energy independent and therefore we're subject to the prices as a result of, you know, inflationary pressures, war in Ukraine and so forth. So I think we're behind where we should be for the resources that we have. Um, and the other thing is that we need to empower households and businesses to be able to, you know, access their own energy, you know, outside of the grid, just have solar on the roof, make batteries, you know, more accessible, more affordable, and to, you know, in, not, in the not so far future, have batteries on wheels, which will be their electric vehicles as well. Mm. And be able to empower people to do that means sort of reducing the hurdles. So making sure that we, you know, have affordable loans, interest-free loans, so it becomes a no-brainer, um, and also making sure we overcome hurdles regarding strata properties and rental properties and, you know, commercial buildings. So those hurdles where a tenant may want to access that free, you know, I say in inverted commas, free solar, mm. it's, it's free after, you know, you've done your mm. payback of yeah. your in, in original investment. Um, but to access that, we just need to remove some of those regulatory hurdles as well. Mm. So I think there's more to be done. And that's why at a New South Wales state level, there's lots of opportunity there to incentivise people to be able to have their own energy independence and have solar on their roof mm. and, um, and storage either in, you know, their EV or a battery on the side of the wall. Yeah, it was interesting. I was actually invited by uh, by an organisation that's fairly reliant on moving their products through uh, petrol stations. Um, and as a futurist, they invited me to do some scenario planning with them on um, the petrol station of the future because they see, uh, you know, moving some of the products that people ordinarily would have picked up as a snack uh, when we're travelling in, in Australia. Um, they're going, well, if 
you know, if no one's filling up on petrol, what do we need petrol stations for? And, uh, and it's another example of either, you know, a, a piece of infrastructure that might be retrofitted with, you know, um, supercharging stations, but, you know, the whole the whole building might actually serve a, a different, different purpose, purpose because people would have, you know, filled up at home um, being essentially solar powered. So yes. um, it's interesting to see how these shifts change and how business models are going to have to change as a result. I want to just stay with this um, idea of, of electrification and rewiring the nation. In my um, in the Saudi Arabia of Scandinavia, in Norway, um, uh, which, <laughs> yeah. of course, the oil and gas industry pay yeah. for a lot of their uh, green transition uh, infrastructure, they've got, you know, charging infrastructure for EVs. It's omnipresent. EV owners don't pay GST uh, on their vehicles and EV drivers can go in the bus lane, uh, making their commutes faster if they ever need to go to the office. And of course, these types of incentives, they've led to a massive adoption of electric vehicles and the electrification of many homes. Um, Tesla's got 16% market share in Norway, uh, just to give you a sense. But um, give us some examples of what politicians and governments can do to, again, accelerate the transition here in New South Wales so we became become a sustainable sustainability leader as opposed to a, a laggard. Okay, so I think this actually needs to be looked at um, from, you know, a holistic big picture perspective as well because there are lots of things we can do at an individual level. So, for instance, the federal government's just removed, um, you know, fringe benefits tax on electric vehicles over a certain amount and that's great but it's, you know, one tiny piecemeal piece of policy that sits, you know, in a void on its own. Um, and I think particularly some of those things you mentioned. So, yes, we completely need the infrastructure and, you know, we've had announcement after announcement, but as you say, to the average person, we can't see the infrastructure. You know, in, in our electorate, we've got a couple of, you know, EV charging stations which are privately owned, um, but we definitely haven't had the rollout that, you know, other jurisdictions have had even in the UK and obviously Norway as well. Mm -hmm. So, yes, we need the infrastructure and, again, we've seen the New South Wales government come out with a big plan, you know, moments before the election when, independents start talking about it. Um, we also need to oh. make sure we incentivise, yeah, through those tax breaks. Um, so another example is uh, the Victorian government is trying to basically replace, um, re you know, charge EV users a tax to pay for, or they call it a, you know, a charge or whatever to pay for roads. Um, and interestingly enough, New South Wales government has jumped on that court action to say, look, we support this chain, you know, this okay. tax that, well, it's not a tax because states can't tax, but, you know, this levy or charge mm -hmm. that the Victorian government's trying to trying to put on EV owners. So that's just the wrong thinking. We need to remove those hurdles and provide those incentives. And then on a broader level, we also need to look at how can we actually drive more electric vehicles, pardon the pun, mm -hmm. into the country because we have a shortage of them and they're expensive. And then that's when you'd want to look to a model similar to what's being done in the US with their Anti-Inflation Act. And the reason it's anti-inflationary is coming back to that concept of energy independence because if you have your own energy, it's not it's not, you, you know, you, you're immune, obviously, from the inflationary rises with that. And so part of that um, Inflation Reduction Act is actually to incentivise more value-add services um, and production within America. And for Australia, that means, you know, getting our critical minerals that are needed for, say, battery production, making sure we value-add here hopefully manufacturing here as well, um, but if not building our value chain for, you know, our production and contribution to making EVs so we actually get a bit more of market flow of those vehicles coming here and mm. um, at the moment they're being lost to other jurisdictions and so we're not even getting the volume of EVs we need mm. entering the country. So it's a bit of a three-prong approach by enabling people to afford them and access them, having them in the country, and then also, you know, providing the infrastructure for them to be charged and particularly in Australia with long distances, we need that. Yeah, because, um, uh, yeah, I drive a, a plug-in uh, electrical hybrid and um, pretty much around the peninsula and getting to the CBD, I'm fine just on... on um, on the electrics uh, to get to town or to get to the airport or whatever it happens to be, uh, where we fly a carbon offset, of course. Um, but uh, the range is only about 50 kilometers. So, yes, you get into the CBD, but then you need to plug in or uh, you get to the airport and then you need to plug in. And it's interesting just in terms of even Sydney Airport, 
you know, oftentimes when I go to the, you know, go to the airport, I have to find a very illegal way of plugging in my vehicle. And when I've asked, you know, parking inspectors and people who work there, uh, if I can uh, borrow a little bit, a bit of power, they go, no, 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 no. You can't, can't touch can't, our you electrics. Can't, yeah, can't, can't do that because, yeah. because of liability issues. And I'm like, it just doesn't sit right um, with me because I don't think it's a, it's a BS excuse. But um, also, I think we all need to do our bit to actually electrify and provide the infrastructure so that people, you know, we can actually nudge and also reward behaviours where people are adopting new and sustainable uh, technology. So, uh, my Twitter feed is full of these complaints about Sydney Airport at the moment. It's a pet, pet peeve of mine. And there's a lot we can learn from other jurisdictions because they have. It, we're sort of laggards in this area, but the benefit of being a laggard, which I don't like to be, by the way, but the benefit of that is that we can learn from the teething issues of the UK, where they've had lots of these teething issues, um, and we can provide sort of best practice from the outset. We've just got to get on and do it, and that's where the political will is missing. I think. Mm. Now, um, one, one person who drives a Tesla is Matt Keane. Um, he seems to be a very, you know, valiant climate warrior, but uh, he's also working within a, li a liberal context. Um, what's the actual track record from a sustainability fossil fuel perspective under the current liberal government and is it good enough? I'd say it's not good enough, but I also don't want, similar to what we said about, you know, greenwashing before, you know, I don't want to let greenwashing get in the way of all the great things that people do and, you know, it's part of that transition. And so I think the current New South Wales government has done great things in terms of um, the electricity infrastructure, um, the renewable energy zones and really bringing to life that renewable transition of our grid, which I think is fantastic. Um, I think they are lacking in other areas, you know, particularly EV rollouts. We've just talked about the infrastructure. But the two gaping holes are really the continual approval of coal and gas. And since the Paris Agreement, there have been 26 new coal and gas mines or, you know, extensions approved under the New South Wales government. Um, and the other big area is continually, you know, chopping down and logging our native forests. Um, and that just does not make sense for a number of reasons. The first reason is it's our native forests and, you know, we need them because of our biodiversity crisis and particularly koalas, which are set to be extinct by 2050 unless New South Wales government significantly intervenes. Um, the second reason is their carbon stores. So it's almost a no-brainer when you're trying to meet emissions targets to actually retain what you've got. And the third reason, it doesn't make economic sense. So the New South Wales government subsidises, um, you know, uh, New South Wales forestry to be able to do all that logging. It's not profitable and it goes to low value products. So, you know, I'm sure there are a couple of listeners who might have hardwood floors who think, oh, but I really want my hardwood floors. The majority of the native forest is not going to high value uses. It's going to wood chipping, shipped offshore, sent overseas and, um, and used for low value uses. So I think the things that really need to be addressed are that native forest logging and that means, um, you know, the, the current government may be negotiating with the National Party, which seems to be, you know, part of the coalition that's slowing that progress down um, to retain our native forests and also to prevent the amount of land clearing on private land of native mm. forest as well. And then obviously, you know, we can't stick our head in the stand in terms of coal and gas approvals. And part of that is not just saying no to them, but also saying, okay, so how can we make New South Wales a leading state in terms of renewable um, economy? Mm. And that's to do with, you know, innovation, making sure we're not letting innovators in this area, you know, run offshore to get funding and to get, you know, grants that they need. Um, it's supporting women in STEM, which is an area that needs, you know, significant growth and STEM in general. And it also means looking at other mining opportunities such as critical minerals and how we can value add here um, in terms of, you know, not sending them offshore to be refined, um, doing that refining process here as well. And I know mm. that's underway, particularly at a federal level, but we need to make it a big focus of state level as well. Well, this is the big irony, right, in terms of Australia and, you know, we sit on these amazing critical minerals um, um, that will enable the green transition. For example, 50% of the world's lithium is in is in Australia, but Australia just ships it overseas to you know Korea or China. It gets refined over there, then gets sent to a factory um, over in in the UK and put into you know a battery somewhere, and it comes out as a you know as a Land Rover here in uh, Avalon later on that we import. And it just yeah. seems silly that Australia doesn't capture more of the value given some of these natural endowments. It just seems crazy. 
It is yeah. crazy. Yeah. And I think that's where the, what the U- US is doing makes a lot of sense because one of the big arguments is, oh, well, our labor's too expensive here or electricity's too expensive. Whereas, you know, once we get the renew- uh, renewable grid and, you know, we embrace renewables, electricity costs go down and there can be tweaks that the government gives to sort of enable us to overcome some of the issues regarding, you know, expensive labor by, you know, incentivizing companies to stay on shore to do or to expand their services to do, you know, minerals processing as well. So mm. I think this is why I have a problem with ideology and and rhetoric about, oh, it's only free markets and, you know, rhetoric about n- neoliberal values when the reality is that doesn't actually even exist in this country and we continue to subsidise, like I mentioned, the native forest logging, but we continue to heavily subsidise the fossil fuel industry as well. Mm. Um, even in the last budget, um, the main arm um, development, you know, so much funding was given in terms of building the infrastructure to support that development as well. So I think we really need to rethink how we're subsidising certain industries and, you know, better transition to those renewable industries and there are a lot of companies ready to go just waiting for the policy direction Um, and also then making sure we transition the coal mining communities and the communities that, you know, do have their industries sort of slowing down over time and making sure we, we, we support them through that transition. Mm, absolutely. And I guess the good news is that if you don't want your tax dollars to be supporting uh, subsidies for fossil fuel industry, there are alternatives um, to, uh, to some of the embedded interests out there. Um, we're into the final zone here, final innings. Um, I'm curious um, if you were to do a little bit of a futuristic time travel out to the critical UN Sustainable Development Goals year of 2030, um, and you just imagine that because of your and other teal independence influence, Pittwater and New South Wales are now thriving. Uh, this place here is one of the most sustainably livable areas in the world. Uh, what are the three things that led us to this futuristic um, uh, odyssey or uh, utopian image of the peninsula and uh, its surrounding areas? And what legacy do you want to contribute to within this context? Well, it's, I think, kind of ironic because I'm going to say one of the things is just conservation and conserving, which is you know, it doesn't sound very futuristic at all, keeping things the same. But I think particularly where we live on the peninsula and also thinking about the special places around New South Wales, like those native forests that are being logged, part of it is just stopping and appreciating what we've got and working out how we can retain the natural beauty, the biodiversity corridors, the clean water, and making sure we put policy measures in place, whether that be, you know, fighting over development and the clearing of you know, whole blocks of land um, to, you know, to keeping keeping our beaches, you know, flood resilient so we don't get, you know, con- water, contaminated water mm. and we don't have offshore drilling to make our water, you know, sorry to LA, to any LA listeners, but, you know, murky like LA mm. or subject to oil spills. So I think part of it is conservation um, and making sure we sort of ap- apply those principles where we can across the state. I think the other the other thing is um, community involvement in democracy and in decision making. So we have a lot of competing interests that need to be considered as we look into the future of you know 2030, and we can't stick our head in the sand with those things. So we have a growing population. We have a housing crisis. Um, we have this want to conserve our natural beauty. And, you know, we've got koalas we want to protect. And how do we bring all those together and actually forge a future that's that we design as a community and um, with future thinking, looking mm-hmm. at best practice from around the world as well? Mm-hmm. And so I think involving community in that decision making, and there are some great models of deliberative democracy that have been used by the South Australian government, um, used by jurisdictions all around the world. And so so, you know, maybe having a model where we, you know, set a project and use a deliber- deliberative democracy style for a community to come up with their vision for, you know, their electorate for the future mm. would be really beneficial. And also having, you know, uh, voices of the community, like independents such as mm. myself, in parliament to really think about um, innovative ways to tackle these problems. And again, it's like the EV policy. I think it's not about these piecemeal 
policies that are announced and thrown. It's it's actually strategic thinking about an almost dream casting and reverse engineering. What do we want to look like by 2030, 2050, and how do we reverse engineer that? Um, and looking to best practice as well, such as, you know, design models from overseas and even the stuff Singapore's doing in terms of, you know, making themselves the garden state and, you know, using innovative design in the way that they approach developments and so forth. Um, so I think, I don't know if there's two or three in there, but I think, you know, mm. bringing community back in, um, conserving what we've got and also that future thinking and best practice and reverse engineering from there. So mm. that's three, I think. Yeah, and it's almost, I'm, I'm almost thinking here that it's um, the most innovative thing we can do is actually conserving some of the things we've got, like yes. nature. And uh, there's a certain bu beauty in, in that notion that uh, conservation is actually very innovative. <laughs> we, we, we have to stop cutting down uh, forests and stop doing environmental damage as, 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 as a start. Um, and, and just even like in our electorate as well, it's, you know, it's thinking what we want and also involving the community in, say, like the Beaches Link Tunnel is a great example. It's going to be a huge piece of infrastructure. The business case hasn't been released and we need to think, okay, so we're going to save, you know, 10 minutes on our travel journey, but at what cost? So mm. will there be a government requirement that we, you know, have a lot more diver um, dense housing along that corridor that they'll be providing for, you know, billions of dollars. And I think that's where the community needs to sort of think through this holistic perspective. Mm. And the same even with waste. We've got a, a tip in our area, the Kimbricky tip, um, but we don't even have, as you would know, we don't even have, um, you know, organic waste collection. So we can't if you want to, if you want to be doing um, composting, you need to do that in your own garden. There's no mm. way that you can just sort of put your composting out for garbage collection. So I think even in our own electorate, there's a lot, a lot of ways that we can actually envisage a, a more circular economy and um, and better future. Mm. So I have to admit, the uh, rat population at our house is uh, is slightly up at the moment because apparently, according to uh, Ornella, our Italian nanny. Um, Composting is one of my passions, and so I do composting. But apparently, uh, despite the fact that we get beautiful organic soil for our garden, uh, sadly, it also attracts a few a few. Do rats. you have a sub pod though? I do also have a sub pod because uh, sub pods are meant to be rat proof, and yeah, I love my sub pod. They are, but it's uh, one of four compost that we okay. have, and the other ones are not as rat proof. That's the <laughs> sub pod. But quick plug there for the sub pod, which I also love. Um, Anything that you want to add? Any requests of our listeners and viewers? Where can people learn more? How can people get behind the campaign? What can we um, do? Well, I think the the only request for everyone, no matter where you're living, is I suppose just get involved in your democracy. I think there's this concept that, oh, my vote's wasted if I vote this way or it doesn't make a difference or, you know, people yelling at the TV or, you know, yelling at the radio. And I think uh, one of the best quotes that, I, that I've heard lately is, you know, don't get mad, get elected. Um, and really, there's so much benefit to getting involved in your democracy and either standing up to represent your community or just being involved with your local member and understanding, I suppose, that pathway to how to make change happen. And I think it is hard as well because an MP can't represent every single individual on every single issue, but that's where this concept of individual action, then collective action as a group, you know, or, or as an organisation, then engaging with, you know, business and also your local MP and then having that MP represent, you know, that that community voice, it's very powerful. So it follows this chain and the best thing as you can do as an individual, I think, is, you know, use your own sphere of influence and engage in your democracy. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for uh, for no longer yelling at the television. I don't know if that ever happened, <laughs> but uh, for also, you know, being a community member, standing up and turning your recycling rage into something really, really meaningful and look forward oh, to seeing where, where this torch-bearing leads and, and future generations as well to remember that. Yeah, and um, I think uh, the only other thing I'd say as well, like you mentioned future generations and I've, I was talking to someone who's, you know, only 18 now and I think it's also that concept of not being overwhelmed by all the negativity or, you know, when, when you're, you know, when you think about, say, climate risk, it can be overwhelming, but there's also all this climate opportunity as well. And actually, my journey started when I was six years old and my grandfather, who was an academic, no internet at this stage, but told me about climate change. And I thought, well, why isn't anyone doing anything about it? I was completely perplexed. And I think action and um, getting involved is the best sort of antidote to that 
climate anxiety and um, I would encourage, you know, everyone, particularly the younger generation, to just seek out the opportunities to take action, to get involved in all the opportunities that this transition brings and um, and that's the best sort of panacea for mm. any anxiety that may be brewing around. Yeah. And I think even, you know, on an entrepreneurial business level, you know, Larry Fink from BlackRock, you know, they've launched a, launched a circular economy fund, for example, largest uh, fund manager in the world. His forecast is the next thousand unicorns are going to come from the clean tech, green tech, sustainability space. So huge opportunities. Huge there. Yeah, absolutely. And so whether it's school striking for climate or, or becoming a, a politician, um, yeah, I wish or you- Or starting your own business. Or starting your own business. You can even make, make a difference there as a, as a B Corp or as a social impact business. Thank you for, uh, for leading the charge into the future and all the best in the elections. Thanks very much. For more information about the Second Renaissance and our work on sustainable innovation, please visit my website, www.andersumanilson.com. We would appreciate if you can take a moment to share the podcast with a friend or a colleague and help build the movement. We hope that what we learn together on the Second Renaissance can help us all build a sustainable future for ourselves and our children. See you in the near future.